Hi, good morning and welcome back to another edition of Discover History here at the Keys History and Discovery Center. I'm Brad Bertelli and today we're going to talk a little bit about lighthouse history. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in and Erin is manning the high-tech camera action we got going and she'll be happy to relay those messages to me. Otherwise, I will get back to you later in the day and answer any questions that you might have. So today we're going to talk about the Dry Bank Lighthouse, not a, a, not a name you hear a, a, a lot. Um, this was uh, originally supposed to be built at Coffins Patch Reef, which is about four miles off of Key Colony Beach in the Middle Keys. It's a shallow uh, inshore reef area. Um, and they began building this lighthouse and until uh, 1856 when a Hurricane, tropical storm, something in between. I know there was a gale force winds recorded in Key West, just heavy winds up in Miami. Um, the storm didn't really track through the, uh, along, uh, along the Keys, um, but it was definitely in the, in the Florida Straits. And at some point, I believe, uh, well, in 1856, um, it did damage. The uh, workers had begun to uh, build a construction uh, or, or build a, 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 a platform. On, from which to start building the Iron Pile Lighthouse. Um, and, but during the hurricane in 1856, the platform was damaged. And after that, the Lighthouse Board said, hey, hold on a minute, let's rethink this location. It seems kind of uh, you know, uh, vulnerable to storm intrusion since this was not really even a, a, a major hurricane that damaged the area. So they um, took a break and they decided to move the, uh, the construction site about nine miles south to a place called Dry Bank. And this is off of Vaca Key in the Middle Keys. And Dry Bank was, uh, I talked a little, bit about, a little bit about it last week. Dry Bank is also known as Sombrero Key. And this is um, considered uh, the easternmost key in the Florida Keys chain. In 1837, it was described as a rocky, kind of a rocky area with some mangroves, and uh, a rocky islet with some mangroves and some debris from shipwrecks. Uh, not much out there, uh, depending on the, um, on the tide, sand would, would congregate you know, um, over, over the years and come and disappear and come and disappear. But they decided to move the, move the uh, construction of the lighthouse to this dry bank area. And George Meade, who um, was put in command of the project, he had previously um, taken over the project at Carey's Fort, Light Reef, uh, Carey's Fort Reef Lighthouse. And then also, he would also work on the Sand Key Lighthouse um, to the further south, closer to Key West, um, after, it, after the original Sand Key Lighthouse was destroyed in the 1846 Great Havana Hurricane. Now, George Meade um, was a lieutenant in the U.S. topographical, uh, oh, the, last, the rest of the name is, is a survey company, or, and which their job was to, to survey the, the uh, shallows and, and the, um, the, the shoreline of the, of the U.S. And George Mead also has a familiar name because after his work on the lighthouses, he would be uh, promoted from lieutenant to general and serve in the Civil War, leading the Union forces, uh, the Battle of the, Pot of, Potam of the Potomac, which defeated, or, or the Army of the Potomac, who defeated Robert E. Lee at the Gettysburg Battle of Gettysburg, the Second Battle of Gettysburg. So he's got a pretty famous name. Um, but before his Civil War years, he was here in the Florida Keys working on three of these iron pile uh, reef lighthouses. And so they would construct this uh, dry bank lighthouse, which, which was the official name of the lighthouse. It was first lit in 1858. And then in 1873, they decided to, the lighthouse board uh, sent out a notice and they decided to rename the lighthouse from uh, uh, Dry Bank Lighthouse to Sombrero Key Lighthouse. And again, not Sombrero Reef Lighthouse, not Sombrero Lighthouse, but Sombrero Key Lighthouse because um, not so much anymore, uh, but there was a small key, a small spit of land that was out there still in the, in the uh, early, uh, early, late 19th century. 
Um, so that is the uh, Sombrero Key Lighthouse. Uh, as we know it today, it is the tallest of the of the reef lighthouses. It stands 160 feet from the uh, from the surface or, or from the uh, bottom of the ocean to the top of the top of the light. Over my shoulder there, you can see a similar looking lighthouse. That's the Alligator Reef Lighthouse that was built also uh, the same year that um, or was first lit the same year that um, Dry Bank Lighthouse was renamed uh, Sombrero Key Lighthouse, and uh, that's 1873. Yes, Aaron. How would they determine where to place these lighthouses? Prior to the building of the lighthouses, I believe in the early, early 1850s, um, there was a, an, another coast uh, survey team that went up and down the Keys and they were looking, because the reef was such a dangerous tract of coral and such a dangerous place for ships to, to, um, to uh, pass between, because you got to remember that all the markets, all the East Coast markets, Philadelphia, Boston, New York, um, uh, the one where my wife grew up, I, which now I can't, in Maryland, I can't think of the, can't think of the, uh, uh, well, Charleston, all, all those markets. Um, all of the, all of the goods and services coming from the middle of the U.S., coming down the Mississippi River through New Orleans would have to be shipped from the port of New Orleans up into, uh, up to the East Coast. And they all had to pass this dangerous, uh, narrow Florida Strait with the, with the Florida Reef. And so they wanted, and because the U.S. government understood how dangerous that, 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 that trek was, they um, assigned the uh, U.S. Coast, Coast Survey, I believe 1851 is the date that comes to mind, when James Totten, uh, who was in command of, of that mission, went and surveyed all the places along the reef to decide where to erect. Um, at first, they were um, not full lighthouses. They were, um, um, uh, oh God, they were 36 foot tall iron screw piles that were driven into the coral reef and then topped with a big barrel of, of, of different color to mark the reef. And then at certain points where the reef was more dangerous than others, for instance, Terry Sport Reef, uh, one of the most, or considered by some the most dangerous tract of coral in all of the uh, Florida, Florida Keys. Um, Alligator Reef was, again, another dangerous one. Uh, Sand Key, uh, Sombrero, or, or you know, Coffins, Coffins, uh, Coffin Patch and then, and then Dry Bank and Sombrero Key. These were really susceptible areas where um, that were particularly dangerous, but also provided enough shallow area in order to build a, a reef there, so or lighthouse there, so it was you know sticking up out of the water. Because remember these these um, these lighthouses, these, these reef lighthouses, had to be really kind of designed to fit the environment. Um, Mead originally had wanted to do a, a masonry tower lighthouse at Coffin Patch. Um, which was not, you know, which they, they did one at, at Sand Key originally was a, a masonry conical tower, that kind of like the more, like, like what you see in Key West and what you see at Garden Key, I'm sorry, at, um, uh, not Garden Key, a Loggerhead Key in the Tortugas, and the, and, and the more common idea of a lighthouse you see all, all, all around the world. And, um, and these were great for land-based lighthouses, but when you get one out in the water, you know, with, with completely, you know, completely exposed to the elements and to the, and to the wind and, and the hurricanes, this masonry tower was not going to be sufficient. As the 1847 um, hurricane, the Great Havana hurricane, uh, uh, revealed when it completely, de completely destroyed that lighthouse on Sand Key, about nine miles north-ish of Key West. So they had to design a, a structure that would, with, that would withstand the environment and withstand the, um, you know, the natural, uh, the storms, the other things that, that, that were going on. Yes? Ellen has a question. She would like to know Hi, Ellen. all of the keys lighthouses manned. Yes. Well, all the lighthouses were manned, yes. There were some beacons there, that, uh, beacons that, that were created that were not manned, but all of the lighthouses, uh, Carries Fort, Alligator, um, uh, Sobrero Key, Sand Key, Key West, uh, Garden Key, and Dry Tortugas, or, or, or Loggerhead Key, that, there's six, I think that was six of them. They were all manned, um, and they were, it was a civilian corps that, that manned them until 1939 when all of the uh, lighthouses were um, uh, meshed into the U.S. Coast Guard service. And then over time, the lighthouses began to become automated, and then they were not, this was 
basically mostly in, in the early 60s. Some rare key lighthouse, for instance, uh, became automated in 1963, and that's when the Coast Guard was, um, was uh, uh, you know, Abandon, abandon the storms. But in 1960, during Hurricane Donna, for instance, these, these uh, lighthouses were still, uh, at least Alligator and Sobrero Key, for instance, for sure, were, were still manned, and those people rode out those hurricanes. Um, if you can imagine, I know at Alligator Reef Lighthouse, uh, during that 1935 Labor Day hurricane, there's some great, uh, uh, the lighthouse keeper there, I think his name was Purvis, um, has a great documentation of, of, of the events that went on at that lighthouse um, during, the, you know, during, the, during the hurricane and watching this 20-foot wall of water kind of building up and moving across the ocean and, and crashing against, crashing against the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the the platform and, 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 and the tower. But yes, they were all manned until the 1960s. In 1963, Sombrero Key was automated. And if I did not mention, uh, Sombrero Key Lighthouse is the tallest, I think 160 feet is what I said, hopefully. And then uh, the, focal, the, the, the focal plane, uh, which, which is kind of the area, the, op, the optimal center point of the lens, the distance between that and the kind of surface of the water, which is known as the focal plane, was 142 feet um, at Sombrero Key. And that still is, is the highest, the highest uh, uh, tallest and, and the highest uh, focal plane along the reef system. So that's our little, uh, our little, our, well, here's another kind of interesting, interesting thing I, I, I picked up on. Um, so in about 1926, Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover um, started promoting, uh, understood how lonely these lighthouse, you know, workers were, these, these people out, out of lighthouses, how lonely and isolated that, that outpost was. So he began to, um, to advocate for them to have for them to have, uh, have radio so they could communicate with the outside world. If there was a hurricane, for instance, they would raise one flag or two flags and then people with binoculars or you know, spy glasses at, at the shore could, could look out and see, oh, the, the lighthouse tender has, has, has raised a hurricane flag so you know, bad, bad things are coming. But um, it, it was Her Herbert Hoover who, uh, who advocated for uh, these radios because they weren't paid a whole lot um, for instance, in, in, the 18, in the 1850s, when, um, when uh, the, the assistant light keeper at Sombrero Key and, and it carries forward everywhere else, an assistant keeper was paid $300 a year plus one meal a day. Um, but, but you got a roof over your head most of the time. But you're stuck out there for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time, so the, for, for them to have a radio in order to communicate with the outside world must have been a boon to their, you know, their, their livelihood and, and, and their peace of mind so they wouldn't go crazy. Could you imagine if you get stuck out there with a, with a, a couple of people just in this confined small area day after day, week after week. Um, during the pandemic, you know, people are stuck in their houses and they're going a little stir crazy. Imagine being just out in the middle of nowhere, <clears throat> unable to, to, to move. It would have a, be nice to, have a radio to communicate to the outside world. <clears throat> now we do have some great events coming up on this Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Corey Convertito, the curator down at the Key West Art and Historical Society, will be doing a, uh, a, a presentation on the history of tourism. And that is uh, an in-person and virtual, uh, there's two components to that. I believe registration for in-person ends today at five o'clock. And if you, so if you want to register, if, if you want to come to the facility and see the presentation, Corey will be here. Uh, doors open at 5.30 um, and it is free for, free for uh, members, $10 for non-members for in-person. And then if you want to register for the online version of the presentation, uh, free from uh, members and, and non-members of $5. And that registration is open, until, I believe, till five o'clock tomorrow night. Also, we have the uh, uh, annual fundraiser at Night at the Museum, which is uh, Hot Havana Nights or some version of that, Havana Nights, Havana Night at the Museum. Um, that's, that's the word. We, the the, the um, online auction is now available, so if you can't attend the event in person and you still want to bid on some great um, raffles and prizes, uh, that auction is available, and you just visit our, uh, the site, keysdiscovery.com, and I believe there's a banner on top that you can, uh, you, you can click and navigate to trips and artwork and, model and, and wine collections and all kinds of goodies that you'll be able to, to bid on. 
And that is open, uh, opened yesterday, so that, that, that's available. That closes on the, on, on this Saturday, which is when the, the event is. So feel free to support the Keys History Disco Discovery Center, score yourself some great prizes. Tune in tomorrow or on Wednesday for Dr. Corey Convertito, a great friend of the, of the Discovery Center and a great friend of mine. Yeah, that's great to register for that. And visit the keysdiscovery.com website and you can register for that as well. Registration, you must register. And uh, so we hope to see you at the, either here at the museum at the, uh, for her talk or online or at, at the event this Saturday um, for the uh, Havana Night at the Museum. And in the meantime, have a great week and we'll see you next Tuesday, 10 o'clock for more interesting tidbits here at Discover History.